Amen. Amen. I'll start out. Good morning, Father. Good morning, Jesus. And good morning, Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We lean on you and we need you. Thank you for waking mm. us up this morning, getting us started on another journey. Thank you for our body parts that still work. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us when there are times we know we don't deserve it. But thank you, Father, for Amen. loving us, for giving us strength to get through each day. I know whatever you bring to us, you will get us through it. So I thank you for that. Thank you for the Sunday school class. Thank you for all the students and Heavenly Father. Thank you for our teachers. Open up our minds, open up our hearts that we can receive this lesson that will come forth on this morning. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Father God, I ask that you be a fence all around us. Bless us, Father, as we go out and as we come in. Open up our, our mind and our hearts to receive the sermon that will come forth uh, later on this morning. I thank you. So, Father God, it is in your, your son, mighty, mighty name, Jesus Christ, that I pray and say amen. 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 Thank you, Verna. You're amen. Amen. So here we go. Okay, so our lesson today is Beware of the Serpent. Last <coughs> last week we um last week finished we, um, persecution, prayer, and power. I hear an echo. Hold on a minute. Last week, our lesson was persecution, prayer, and power. We finished part two of that. And our lesson last week ended in verse 31. The glory of God, not the, need, um, not the needs of prayer of men, is the highest purpose of answered prayer. So the glory of God, not the needs of men, is the highest purpose of answered prayer. God's answer was to shake the place where they were meeting and to fill the people once again with the spirit of God. The spirit of God gave them the boldness that they needed to continue to serve God in spite of official opposition. This was not a second Pentecost because there cannot be another Pentecost any more than there can be another Calvary. It was a new feeling of the spirit intended to equip the believers to serve the Lord and to minister to the people. So this week uh, in Beware of the Serpent, we will look at the generosity of the believers as well as the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira. After the events in verse 31, the new church being united in prayer developed a community of oneness. Our lesson today consists of a contrast of two stories, and we can best describe uh, those stories as two testimonies. The one demonstrating an act of Barnabas and another of the husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira. So let's get started in um, looking at our story and then we go a little further. Okay, so for our introduction, Lily will read the introduction and the lesson text that will follow. You may unmute yourself, Lily. 
Satan had failed completely in his attempt to silence the witness of the church. However, the enemy never gives up. He simply changes his strategy. His first approach had been to attack the church from the outside, hoping that arrests and threats would frighten the leaders. When that failed, Satan decided to attack the church from the inside and use people who were a part of the fellowship. We must face the fact that Satan is a clever foe. If he does not succeed as, de as the devouring lion, then he attacks again as the deceiving serpent or an angel of light. Satan is both a murderer and a liar, and the church must be prepared for both attacks. Uh, demonstration Acts 1, Lesson Text, Acts 4, 32-37. And, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now, Joseph, a Levite superior, Cyprian, of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which in translations means son of encouragement and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, thank you, Lily. Okay, thank you, Lily. You're welcome. Okay, and then our commentary will be read by Claudia. Generosity of the believers. The believers had prayed and God's spirit had filled them and given them new power. The church that depends on believing prayer will know the blessings of the Holy Spirit in this ministry. How can we tell when a local church is really filled with the spirit? When you go back to the record of the first uh, filling of the uh, Pentecost, you discover three outstanding characteristics of a spirit-filled church. One, it is unified. There is a God-given spiritual unity, not a man-made organizational uniformity. The church is an organism system of life that is held together by life, and that life comes through the Holy Spirit. Of course, the church must be organized, must have structure, or it, it or if an organism or Organism is not organized, it will die. However, when the organization starts to hinder spiritual life and ministry, then the church becomes just another religious institution that exists to keep itself going. When the Holy Spirit is at work, God's people will be united in their doc doctrinal beliefs as well as in fellowship, giving and worship. Number two, a spirit-filled church is magnified and will have favor with all the people. In spite of the opposition of the rulers, the common people were drawn to the believers because something new and exciting was happening. When the religious leaders tried to silence the church, it was their fear of the people that restrained them. Yes, a spirit-filled church will have its enemies, but what the Lord is doing will attract the attention and admiration of people who are hungry to know God. Number three, a spirit-filled church is multiplied because the Lord will daily add new believers to the church. Evangelism will not be the work of the chosen few, but the daily delight and ministry of the whole co congregation. In the early church, each member sought to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ. No matter where he happened to be, no wonder the church grew from 120 to over 5,000 in just a short time. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 
How does Satan's attack affect the spiritual condition of the church? Not at all. The fact that Peter and John were arrested, tried, and threatened had absolutely no effect on the spiritual life of the church. For the church was still unified, magnified, and multiplied. One evidence of the unity of the church was the way they sacrificed and shared with one another. When the Holy Spirit is at work, giving is a blessing and not a burden. We must keep in mind that this Christian communism was very unlike the political communism of our day. What the believers did was purely voluntary and was, motiv was motivated by love. No doubt, many of the new believers were visitors in Jerusalem, having come for the feast, and they had to depend on their Christian friends to help meet their daily needs. Nor should we think that every believer sold all his goods and brought the money to the apostles. In the case that some of the members from time to time sold various pieces of property and donated to the common treasury when the assembly had a need. The spirit directed someone to sell something and meet the need. While the early church's spirit of sacrifice and love and generosity is worthy of our emulation, believers today are not required to imitate these practices. The principles of Christian giving are outlined in the epistles, especially in 2 Corinthians 8 through 9, and nowhere are we instructed to bring our money and lay it at the pastor's feet as though he was an apostle? It is the spirit of their giving that is important to us today and not the letter of their, of their system. Joseph, nicknamed Barnabas, son of encouragement, is introduced at this point for several reasons. First, he was a generous giver and illustrated the very thing Dr. Luke was describing. Second, his noble act apparently filled Ananias and Sapphira with envy, so they attempted to impress the church with their giving and ended up being killed. Third, Barnabas had a most important ministry in the church and is mentioned at least 25 times in the book of Acts and another five times in the epistle. In fact, if Barnabas was encouraged, Paul, if, if in fact, it is Barnabas who encouraged Paul in the early service for the Lord and who gave his cousin John Mark the encouragement he needed after his failure. Levites were not permitted to own land, so it is difficult to understand how Barnabas acquired the property that he sold. Perhaps that particular law applied only in Palestine and the property was in Cyprus. Or perhaps the corrupt religious leaders had become lax in enforcing the law. There is much we do not know about Joseph Barnabas, but this we do know. He was a spirit-filled man and was an encouragement to the church because he gave his all to the Lord. Not every believer can be like Peter and John, but we can all be like Barnabas and have a ministry of encouragement. Okay, thank you, Claudia. You're welcome. Okay, so next, Brandon will read our summary for that portion. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, the church was unified through the Holy Spirit and communal living was instituted. This communal living was one, voluntary. Two, it didn't involve all private property, but only as much as was needed, and three, it was not a membership requirement in order to be a part of the church, but offered through the Jerusalem church. The first century church set the bar high when they demonstrated biblical sharing. As the church grew rapidly, many new believers from other regions lingered in Jerusalem, hungering to be near their new brothers and sisters in Christ. In order to finance this exploding family, those who owned valuables sold them and donated the money for the common good. They shared everything they had, and there were no needy persons among them. Later on, as churches were established in other places, the apostles gathered financial gifts from various churches and delivered them to the Judean church, which was struggling. 
who was Barnabas? He was called an apostle, even though he was not one of the original 12. He was the first to travel with Paul on a missionary journey. During that time, Paul corrected his view of the Gentile believers. Once he saw the evidence of the grace of God, he became an encourager to his fellow Christians, encouraging them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts, and many gave their hearts to the Lord. Don't forget your brothers and sisters in the Lord. When you get strength, go back and strengthen them. It only takes a turn to repent. Once you turn, convince your brothers and sisters to turn. None of these Christians felt that they, none of these Christians felt that what they had was their own. So they were able to give and share, eliminating poverty among them. They would not let a brother or a sister suffer when others had plenty. How do you feel about your possessions? We should adopt the attitude that everything we have comes from God and we are only stewarding what is already his. Amen. Thank you, Brandon. You're welcome. Okay, so that fourth, that first portion uh, sets the stage for our for chapter five in that we were able to see uh, the act of Barnabas, which is what um, what caused uh, Ananias and Sapphira to act in the way that they did. So this is our act two that will take us into uh, the second portion of our lesson. And we will have a Sonia to read our lesson text. Demonstration Act 2, Lesson Text, Acts 5, 1 through 11. Number one, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. The young man, men got up and covered him, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Okay, so it's important for us to realize that in that first act, Ananias and Sapphira were present. So as we look at these, uh, the commentary of the verses one through 11, we need to realize that Ananias and Sapphira were present and that uh, during that prayer time and that act. And now we will have Luana read our commentary for verses one through 11. The Hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira, Acts 5, 1 through 11. George MacDonald wrote, half of the misery in the world comes from trying to look instead of trying to be what one is not. The name that Jesus gave to this practice is hypocrisy, which simply means wearing a mask, playing the actor. We must not think that failure to reach our ideals is hypocrisy because no believer lives up to all that he or she knows or has in the Lord. Hypocrisy is deliberate deception, trying to make people think we are more spiritual than we really are. When I was pastoring my first church, the Lord led us to build a new sanctuary. 
We were not a wealthy congregation, so our plans had to be modest. At one point in the planning, I suggested to the architect that perhaps we could build a simple edifice with a more elaborate facade at the front to make it look more like an expensive church. Absolutely not, he replied. A church stands for truth and honesty, and any church I design will not have a facade. A building should tell the truth and not pretend to be what it isn't. Years later, I ran across this poem, which is a sermon in itself. They build the front just like St. Mark's or like Westminster Abbey. And then, as if to cheat the Lord, they make the back parts shabby. That was the sin of Ananias and Sapphira, putting on a lovely front in order to conceal the shabby sin in their lives, sin that cost them their lives. Ananias means God is gracious, but he learned that God is also holy, and Sapphira means beautiful, but her heart was ugly with sin. No doubt some people are shocked when they read that God killed two people just because they lied about a business transaction and about their church giving. But when you consider the features connected with this sin, you have to agree that God did the right thing by judging them. It is worth noting that the Lord judges sin severely at the beginning of a new period in salvation history. Just after the tabernacle was erected, God killed Nadab and Abihu for trying to present false fire to the Lord. He also had Asian killed for disobeying orders. Aiken. Mm -hmm. Aiken. Thank you. Yes. Killed for disobeying orders after Israel had entered the promised land. While God was certainly not responsible for their sins, he did use these judgments as warnings to the people and even to us. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for... 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 12. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for, for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. To begin with, the sin of Ananias and Sapphira was energized by Satan, and that is a serious matter. If Satan cannot defeat the church by attacks from the outside, he will get on the inside and go to work. He knows how to lie to the minds and hearts of church members, even genuine Christians, and get them to follow his orders. We forget that the admonition about the spiritual armor was written to God's people, not to the believers, because it is the Christians who are in danger of being used by Satan to accomplish his evil purposes. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote, sin has many tools, but a lie is the handle which fits them all. Satan is a liar and a murderer. He lied to and through this couple, and the lie led to their deaths. When God judged Ananias and Sapphira, he was also judging Satan. He was letting everybody know that he would not tolerate deception in his church. Their sin was motivated by pride, and pride is a sin that God especially hates and judges. No doubt the church was praising God for the generous offering that Barnabas had brought, brought when Satan whispered to the couple, you can also bask in this kind of glory. You can make others think that you are as spiritual as Barnabas. Instead of resisting Satan's approaches, they yielded to him and planned their strategy. Jesus made it very clear that we must be careful how we give, lest the glory that belongs to God should be given to us. The Pharisees were adept skilled at calling attention to their gifts, and they received the praises of men, but that's all they received. Whatever we possess, God has given to us. We are stewards, not owners. We must use what he gives us for his glory alone. Daniel Defoe called pride the first peer and president of hell. Indeed, it was pride that transformed Lucifer into Satan, and it was pride, ye shall be as God, that caused our first parents to sin. 
Pride opens the door to every other sin. For once we are more concerned with our rep reputation than our character, there is no end to the things we will do just to make ourselves look good before others. A third feature of their sin was especially wicked. Their sin was directed against God's church. We have reason to believe that Ananias and Sapphira were believers. The spiritual level of the church at that time was so high that it is doubtful that a mere professor, professor could have gotten into the fellowship without being detected. The fact that they were able to lie to the spirit and tempt the spirit would indicate that they had the spirit of God living within. God loves his church and is jealous over it, for the church was purchased by the blood of God's son and has been put on earth to glorify him and do his work. Satan wants to destroy the church, and the easiest way to do this is to use those who are within the fellowship. Had Peter not been discerning, Ananias and Sapphira would have, would have become influential people in the church. Satan would have been working through them to accomplish his purposes. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth, and Satan attacks it with his lies. The church is God's temple in which he dwells, and Satan wants to move in and dwell there too. The church is God's army, and Satan seeks to get into the ranks as many traitors as he can. The church is safe so long as Satan is attacking from the outside. But when he gets on the inside, the church is in danger. In danger. It is easy for us to condemn Ananias and Sapphira for their dishonesty. But we need to examine our own lives to see if our profession is backed up by our practice. Do we really mean everything we pray about in public? Do we sing the hymns and gospel songs sincerely or routinely? These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. If God killed religious deceivers today, how many church members would be left? What is described in this chapter is not a case of church discipline. Rather, it is an example of God's personal judgment. The Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Had Ananias and Sapphira judged their own sin, God would not have judged them, but they agreed to lie, and God had to deal with them. Ananias was dead and buried, and Sapphira did not even know it. Satan always keeps his servants in the dark while God guides his servants in the light. Peter accused her of attempting God's spirit, of tempting God's spirit. That is deliberately dis disobeying God and seeing how far would God would go. They were actually defying God and daring him to act. And he acted with swiftness and finality. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. We must keep in mind that their sin was not in robbing God of the money, but in lying to him and robbing him of glory. They were not required to sell the property. And having sold it, they were not required to give any of the money to the church. Their lust for recognition conceived sin in their hearts, and that sin eventually produced death. The result was a wave of godly fear that swept over the church and over those who heard the story. We have moved from great power and great grace to great fear, and all of these are to be present in the church. Let us have grace whereby whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Thank you, Luana. <clears throat> okay, Thomas will read our summary. <laughs> Thomas, you may unmute yourself. Acts 5, verses 1 through 11. We saw both the internal and external problems facing the early church. Inside the church were dishonesty, greed, and administrative headaches. Outside the church was pressure from persecution. We see in our lesson today the leaders careful 
and sensitive responses in dealing with the internal problems. They could not do much to prevent the external pressures. Through it all, the leaders kept their focus on what was most important, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sin did I hit something wrong? Oh, the sin Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira uh, committed was not stinging the stinging the enough or Stingy. holding back. Stinginess was not stinginess. I can't even <laughs> pronounce it. Holding holding <laughs> back part of the money. Whether to sell their land and how much to give was their choice. Giving was voluntary. Their sin was lying to God and God's people by saying that they had given the whole amount while actually holding back some of some for themselves. Why? They were trying to make themselves appear more generous than they really were. This act was judged harshly because dishonestly, dishonesty, greed, and covetousness are destructive in the church, limiting the effective work of the Holy Spirit. All lying is all lying is bad, but when we lie to, to try to deceive God and his people about our relationship with him, we destroy our testimony for Christ and disrupt our witness. Understand, even after the Holy Spirit had come, the believers were not immune to Satan's temptations. Although Satan was defeated by Christ at the cross, he was still actively trying to make the believers stumble, as he still does today. Satan's over... Satan's overthrow is inevitable, but it will not occur until the last days when Christ returns to, the, to judge the world. Some read the, amount, some read the account of Ananias and Zephyr being struck down and accuse, and accuse God of being harsh. They say, I thought God was supposed to be loving and forgiving. They think I thought all of that wrath stuff was for Old Testament times. With an emphasis on grace and mercy, we can easily overlook the equally important truth of God's holiness. We must remember that God has not judged. He still hates has sin as changed. much as he... Oh, I'm sorry. We must remember that God has not changed. He still hates sin as much as he ever did. His judgment on Ananias and Sapphira produce shock and fear among the believers, making them realize how seriously God regards sin in the church. Ananias and Sapphira also revealed through their actions that they didn't really believe God is who he says he is. They were trying to appear as devout as Barnabas, and they put their own need for praise and desire for approval ahead of humbly serving God. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Okay, so so that is our uh, lesson context. And then uh, there are six questions for us to reflect on in the course of the week. Next week, we will look at beware of the serpent part two, and then truth and consequences. And now we can open it up for questions and comments. Our kingdom come. Thy will be done today, Father. Father, we thank you. You woke us up this morning, Father, with some form of a right mind. We were allowed to close ourselves and feed ourselves and come on Zoom for this Sunday school, Father. I thank you for Reverend Watson. I thank you for the teaching. Father God, I thank you for Salem Baptist Church, the House of Hope, Reverend James T. Me. Father, I come to you soft-hearted and trying to hold on again, Father. For I know your will will be done. I'm praying for my great niece, baby. And she had to take the life support off her baby, Father God. Have her to give her the strength to hold on. The baby didn't ask her to come here to happen what happened, but it's your will, Father, that everything will be all right. Father, I pray for anyone in this class that's going through any type of illness or heartache right now, Father, because I know you are an answer and a heart fixer. I've been through hardship after hardship, though, Father, Father, but you have brought me thus this far, and I thank you. I thank you for this class more than ever, Father, because it's teaching me to put my trust in you before all things. The devil has tried to take my man, but I gave it back to you, Father. I come to you just to tell this class thank you. For all that we go through every day, when we give our praise to God first, he'll make our battle a little bit easier. I come to you just to tell you thank you. 
I don't know what other people are going through, but I'm going through some storm. But I know through the end of the storm, the rainbow going to shine. It's going to shine bright and beautiful, Father, and I'm going to thank you in advance. I thank you that I'm able to tie mine from my growth because I know for every dime I give you, you have managed to give it back to me. Father, all I can tell you is thank you. Thank you to all that I'm going through, but I know at the end, you're going to make my mind in glory, Father, and I can just say amen.